Hey everyone, today on the final bar, we're gonna talk about a market continuing to push higher. Big week this week in terms of uh, you know, events for Amazon, Apple, really pushing that uh, space in the market higher and dragging pretty much everything up with it. But also you have a lot of big banks uh, reporting earnings this week. There's all sorts of potential catalysts coming in. And so what uh, I think the story of this week is gonna be the story of these big names and whether they are pushing forward or taking a breather. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets, look at the charts together, try to make sense of the uh, trajectory of the trends and uh, anticipate when trends may be exhausted, when, uh, when we might have inflection points. As I mentioned in the introductions, you know, heavy news flow and, and when, uh, this week. And when we think about stocks, I think it was Wells Wilder in his book, uh, he wrote a book on technical trading systems. This is where RSI and DMI and parabolic studies and other indicators that we sort of take for granted. This is where they were sort of unleashed onto the world. Uh, and, you know, we talked in the introduction about the benefits of analyzing commodities instead of stocks. And his whole point was that, um, you know, with commodities, you don't have the company risk. You don't have the earnings risk and all those things, all those little news events that a, a an equity or a company can uh, can put out there that, that causes a very quick valuation change in the, in the stock. You know, this week we're seeing that. And I think as we, as we look at some of the charts like Apple and Amazon, remember stock analysis, equity uh, interpretation is all about pricing in of expectations. It's all about what people are expecting from the iPhone 12 and from, you know, the Amazon Prime days and, and all of that. And so let's look at the charts together and try to make sense of what the market is telling us about future prospects. Now we have other guests coming through this week. We've had some wonderful guests over the last couple of weeks, giving us their take on what's happening during this uh, you know, uncertain period, this transition period. Tomorrow we have Jeff Weiss from Clearview Trading Advisors. Jeff was one of my early mentors and taught me so many great lessons about long-term charts and how to be patient and how to uh, pay attention to the long-term trends. I'm really excited to have him on the show tomorrow. On Wednesday, Mark Newton from Newton Advisors in New York is gonna be coming back to join the show. And then next week on Monday, we have our next big event, a presidential cycle panel. Uh, I've invited some guests, uh, Jeff Hirsch, Bruce, Fra <laughs> Bruce Frazier, excuse me, and Tom McClellan to join me to have a, a discussion about the presidential cycle. This is the four year cycle and how the market tends to have this cyclical pattern every four years. A lot of people call it the presidential cycle or the election cycle. They're gonna share with us what their tools are telling us about this uh, election year uh, and what to expect based on the average returns uh, in, uh, in this sort of environment, given historical trends around the four-year cycle. So it's gonna be a really cool event, especially if you're not, uh, if you don't use that regularly in your process, it'll be a great introduction to that. So that's coming up on October 19th, next Monday. Into our market recap here. So stocks sold off a little bit going into the close, but really the, the real advance uh, had happened much earlier on. On Friday's show, which is our weekly wrap show, we talked about the long-term trends, you know, pretty much firing positive on all cylinders, the strength that we saw across the board uh, with improving breadth conditions. Uh, and today was sort of a follow through on a lot of those same themes. We talked about S&P 3600, which I mentioned, you know, all time highs and even a little bit higher, certainly in the cards here in the short term between now and year end. I, I wasn't anticipating today would be when it almost happened, but we were very quickly accelerating uh, around lunchtime. I'm thinking, wow, 3600 actually is just, it's not that far away. It's 500 points away. Uh, however, you know, we settled in just around 35, 34, which is up 1.6%. Mid caps and small caps up as well, but lagged behind the, uh, the broader market. They came off a little bit uh, midday. So this was really dominated by the mega cap, uh, the mega cap trade. Uh, you can see the NASDAQ 100 was up 3% today and technology was the number one sector followed by communication services. They're really the sweet spot for the NASDAQ uh, and, and really led the charge on the way higher. So those of us looking for leadership rotation for different stocks to emerge and, and fill the gap uh, taken from the, uh, the uh, evaporation of the FANG trade today was not it. Today was right back to that 
same theme with some of the bigger names up, uh, you know, four or 5% or so. Bond markets were closed today for uh, Columbus Day, so not a lot of activity here. The TLT was up about 0.3%, but relatively quiet. I think tomorrow we'll see a little bit of more, a, more of, a, of a change uh, if needed. Going to commodities, gold and silver down a little bit, but only uh, about a third of a uh, percent or less, so not a huge mover. Oil was down uh, pretty good, and so that's why energy was, uh, was second from uh, second from the bottom, uh, materials was the worst of the 11 S&P sectors. On the top, as I mentioned, tech, communication services, consumer discretionary. This is really the leadership that, uh, that has gotten us to this point. Right after that, though, a couple of interesting sectors, consumer staples and stocks, uh, charts like P&G come to mind that we've talked about in recent weeks, just you know, breaking to new highs, new 52-week highs, strong price and relative trends. That's in consumer staples. So it's not just the FANG trade that's working, other things as well. Financials are a really interesting one to watch, especially this week. Um, you know, the, the S&P was up about 1.6%. Financials only up 1%. But if you look at some of the larger financial firms all starting to report this week, it's going to be a, a potential, you know, uh, potentially some movement in there for sure as stocks uh, anticipate and then react to uh, earnings releases. Looking at a daily chart of the S&P, this is where we're at. You know, we've talked uh, just to orient ourselves the last uh, couple of weeks, really, when the market topped out in September and really sold off, we focused in on this 3,200 to 3,250 level. That held pretty much as you could you could hope. If you're if you're a fan of support and resistance, this has pretty much been the textbook version of why we pay attention to those key levels. The market has memory; it pays attention to that. People are betting, uh, you know, related to those levels, and uh, we never quite got to the low at 3,200. Enough buying uh, power came in to propel the uh, the, the S and P back to the ups. Side. We held our ground around 3,400, 3,430 for, uh, for a little while. And this is based on that previous support and resistance and also the swing highs for September. When we cleared those, which was going into uh, last Thursday's session, my comment was, we, I think we're going to go back to 3,600 and, uh, and beyond. And, and we certainly seem to be accelerating up into those levels. And again, we have a lot of potential catalysts this week. So the big names like Amazon and Apple rallying today are expectations for what we're going to see through the rest of this week with the Amazon Prime Days, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday with the Apple, uh, um, the iPhone 12 coming out uh, tomorrow, the announcements for that and, and the expectations related to those really pushing that, uh, that part of the market over. It's interesting that the S&P is not yet overbought. Even after having this huge run that's starting to accelerate, you can see the pace of that run is increasing as we get further and further away from the 50-day moving average. So, uh, so certainly seeming to rally. This level is not a, a meaningless level, and I would certainly uh, be looking at that 3,600 range. We're sort of getting right into that area of the previous swing highs. Either this holds and we have a bit of a digestion before we may continue higher or we just blow right through this. And I, and I think that's a key one to pay attention to. But again, leading up until this point, the trends overall are holding up, uh, are holding up pretty beautifully. Continuing on here to just some of the uh, other themes that we're, uh, that we're seeing. Interesting to see Netflix, one of the 10 weakest stocks uh, relative to their scooter rankings. And again, so this is essentially a relative ranking looking at which stocks are losing ground relative to their peers. Here we have the stocks gaining the most in their scooter rankings. So which ones are, are gaining ground on their peers are the most? So on the ones that are not working, and this is an important list to look at when it seems like everything's going up, what's not working as well? Netflix is actually one of the, uh, one of the worst 10. Uh, not, not doing too poorly today, so it was, it was essentially flat, but you know, selling off when most things really rallied uh, pretty heavily. Airlines in here as well. So again, that's sort of the, uh, you know, the underperformance of that airline recovery trade that we've been uh, that we've been seeing as the as the fang stocks rolled over these were ones that started to emerge i'm not really seeing that also some big healthcare so eli Lilly, uh hca both having pretty pretty tough days eli Lilly is an interesting one it's actually a uh, a dark cloud cover candle when you have a big up day a big down day we don't quite get below the uh, the close from yesterday the open from yesterday so it's not a bearish engulfing pattern but it's almost as bad it's called a dark cloud cover where we get at least 30 uh, excuse me 50 percent of the way down the body from that first bar. And so some distribution from some big uh, healthcare, particularly in the, uh, in the pharma space. That's our recap for today. And again, market pushing higher, all the offense essentially pushing higher uh, as, we, uh, as we continue this pursuit of 3,600 all-time highs. Our next segment is sector setup. So now that we've talked about the broad market environment, talked about strength essentially across the board, let's get to sector setups and, and focus on some of the sector themes that we can tease out. We usually do a couple things here and we're gonna start with the relative rotation graph, the RRG. 
Uh, this is from uh, Julius de Campaneri created this years ago. I followed uh, this as a as a just an ideal way to visualize the 11 sectors rotating around the S&P. If you're not familiar with this methodology, we can't get too much into the weeds here, but go to uh, Julius's show called uh, Sector Spotlight. It does a really good job explaining how to use this particular visualization. What we're looking at is the weekly data. So we're looking at a longer term view right now. We're looking at the 11 S&P sectors and now they're rotating around the S&P, which is essentially at this zero line at the, uh, the middle of the crosshairs. Further to the right means it's outperforming. So on this longer term time frame, the strongest sectors are really the leadership for today, consumer discretionary and technology, which are one and two on the right side. The next two in terms of overall strength, industrials and materials. Now they're coming off a bit in the last couple of weeks as they start to head more in a south to southwest direction. That's sort of the direction of deterioration as the relative strength is still strong, but the momentum on that is starting to come off a little bit. So it's sort of suggesting that's at the later stages of, uh, of emerging and now starting to lighten up a little bit. You have to see how that continues to rotate and if it does so in a, uh, in a, uh, in a further downward direction. Energy remains the, uh, the weakest uh, by far. And again, on a relative basis from a technical perspective, very little reason to be looking at energy until you see some sort of change in these uh, sort of patterns. On this longer term time frame, last thing I would notice, uh, you know, utilities and real estate, some very defensive sectors uh, working on a relative basis, uh, you know, starting to increase their, their trend to the, to the right here. Consumer staples as well. And we've hit on some of those stocks uh, recently. When I do screens on stocks making new highs, setting up in positions of strength, uh, some staples names uh, are in there. So it's not, a, uh, it's not a dead sector to you if you're looking at relative strength. There's some stocks that are actually performing pretty well. Very quickly for a shorter term read, let's go to the daily RRG. So now this is looking at a much shorter term time frame, so the last week or so, and seeing how the trends have emerged. Here you can see that utilities really emerged in a stronger position and now rotating kind of due south along with consumer discretionary. And you can see real estate actually took a big 180 and is now heading in a weaker position. What's improving overall, financials, technology, sort of the two that are maybe leaning over to this, uh, to this right side. So you sort, and again, this is not, you know, necessarily reflecting everything we saw uh, today, right? But overall, um, you can see that financials have started to improve. And I think this week is going to be crucial for a lot of those uh, big banks and others that are starting to report earnings. Are they able to, you know, use that as a positive catalyst and start to improve? Or uh, is it just one more, uh, you know, a potential disappointment as they struggle on a relative basis to hold up to some of these other uh, sectors that we've gotten used to seeing at the top of the list? Let's look at the 11 S&P sectors now using the candle glance page. So this is uh, the candle glance function. It's a really good way to visualize a group of things and start to differentiate them. I've often uh, coached people that, you know, analyzing this particular chart with a technical toolkit is the easy part, in my opinion, right? Once you learn the rules, once you learn the methodology, it's just going through a checklist consistently. The real trick, though, is making sure you're looking at the right chart at, at, at the beginning, right? And making sure you're focusing on the right opportunity. That's where things like screening and your routines and your discipline of how you're actually going through and figuring out what charts to look at. That's where it's so crucial. So this is one way you can take a group of things, throw them down on the, it's kind of like if you throw a bunch of photos on the, on the table and start to pick through the ones that, uh, that look pretty interesting to you. The first takeaway as I'm looking at this page of 12, so I have the 11 sectors and then the S&P here, is all but one of these charts are above both of their moving averages. As I'm glancing around, I think that's true, and it is. Um, and that's actually pretty impressive. And if you think of that as a breadth indicator, 11 out of 12 of these above both of their moving averages is, uh, is pretty impressive. Most of them are above two upward sloping moving averages, maybe three or four uh, um, exceptions to that rule, but, uh, but overall still in a very, very positive uh, place. And maybe the the example chart to focus on would be just consumer discretionary, which has been in this nice run from the market low, pulled back to the ascending 50-day moving average, now breaking out to new swing highs. That general shape is the same thing you see from communication services, technology, industrials, materials, and consumer staples. Now, this other group are the ones that are still holding up, but not quite as impressive. So healthcare has been a little choppier. The relative strength has been more suspect. Utilities actually were in a broader base, same with real estate, and just breaking out to the upside there. So impressive breakouts, but have not been in the longer term performance trends that we've seen from the, uh, from the other sectors like, uh, like technology. That leaves our, our, our other thing. So that is what most sectors kind of look like. The two, uh, uh, I guess, uh, deviants from that 
particular uh, view are financials and then energy. So let's look at the two of those one at a time. This is the financial sector. And again, for financials and energy, even if the price trends begin to be constructive, and we are now back above the 200-day moving average for the XLF, that's impressive. We're testing Fibonacci resistance, which lines up beautifully with the swing highs from August and September. That's pretty impressive too, especially if we're able to eclipse these, break above, above the most recent swing high. That would reverse this pattern and make a higher high for the first time in a, in a little while. That would be impressive. But the problem with all of those things is this line at the bottom, which is the relative strength of uh, the financial sector versus the rest of the market. From the beginning of the year, and again, going into the market top, coming out of the, the market uh, top, coming out of the market recovery, financials have been underperforming with the exception of the, the jump into the June market highs. Other than that, it's been relatively weak and energy looks a lot worse than that. So financials right now, from a technical perspective, at a key upside objective, if you're expecting a downturn, this is kind of where you'd expect the upturn to be exhausted, where it's bumping up to resistance, bump, bumping up to previous highs. Um, a lot of stocks reporting this week, which means there's potential for, uh, for a downside catalyst, or it's able to uh, eclipse these highs, relative strength starts to improve, financial once again uh, becomes a sector you want to pay attention to. So I think it's a very important one to be looking at uh, right now. The other one is with energy. And again, from a technical perspective, I am just not a fan of buying lower highs and lower lows with st uh, strong negative performance until some of those things start to change. And potentially energy made a new swing high uh, last week. I think what remains to be seen is can you make a higher low start to go higher and then the relative strength starting to improve. That would have to, you would have to assume for that, that some of these other sectors would take a bit of a breather. But as we mentioned in the introduction, that is not what we're seeing from the uh, traditional offense. They're accelerating to the upside, not lightening up a little bit. That is our sector setups review for, uh, for this Monday afternoon. We're going to take a quick commercial break back with our next segment, Shifting Stocks. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We'd love to hear from you, uh, particularly questions that you're running into as you go through your journey of analyzing charts and trying to draw your own conclusions. Shoot us an email at thefinalbar at StockCharts.com or on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. On YouTube, just put a comment below any of the videos that you're watching. We'll capture all of those and then we'll do another mailbag segment on Tuesday of this week. We would love to answer your question on the air for our next mailbag. Our final segment today is called Shifting Stocks. This is where we uh, continue this three-pronged approach to market analysis, starting with the top-down macro at the beginning, looking at the structural theme of the emergence or re-emergence of the FANG trade and, and the average stock moving higher uh, into this week. Second, the sector setups and looking at the leadership sectors continuing to do well, but also things like financials and others really, uh, you know, approaching key levels that we want to pay attention to. Now we're in our third piece of the puzzle, which is the bottom up stock picking process. And as always, I'd encourage you when we go through the show, what I hope you're able to think about is with your own process. We only have 30 minutes together every day to try to pepper as much little nuggets of insights as we can, but hopefully this encourages you to do your own digging, do your own process, take things we talk about and go a little bit further. And I encourage you to think about those three pieces, the macro, the sectors, and the stocks, and think about how you're approaching each of those pieces every week during your own routine. And I bet there's one or two of those that you could probably upgrade a little bit and, uh, and, and bring some additional charting horsepower to, uh, to your process. What we're going to get to do today for shifting stocks is actually look at the Dow 30. Um, again, we're going to use the candle glance page for this because it's just a great way to sort of compare and contrast different patterns that you, uh, that you see. I want to just take, give you some takeaways. I was looking at this earlier today and it ended up drawing on a lot of the themes I think are pretty important to pay attention to this week. So let's, let's go through them. Now, what you immediately start to recognize, I hope, is, is starting to mentally bucket these different patterns together. So you can see stocks that are just what I call long and strong up and to the right, sort of, you know, aiming in the direction of improvement, you know, nice, strong trends, 
at or near new highs. Those are kind of the stocks hopefully you bought a while ago and that's what your portfolio looks like. But these are stocks like Caterpillar, like McDonald's, uh, like Dow Holdings arguably is not quite at new highs, but close. Procter and Gamble is in that bucket. Nike is in that bucket. Uh, you know, United Healthcare is in there, right? Breaking to, uh, to new highs. Um, you know, even Verizon actually, even though, you know, a little different trajectory going up there, it's kind of moving up into the right. Uh, now, my, my cautionary tale with looking at this visualization in particular is charts can play a bit of a trick on you if you're looking at a pile of them like this, because all of these stocks look like they're the same chart. So Nike, McDonald's, Verizon, United Healthcare all look very similar because they're all kind of teasing the upper right side of that chart. What you want to do is if you look at the individual chart and focus on the relative performance, you can see that that pattern right here on Caterpillar, which looks a lot like the other ones, that has outperformed the S&P for the last 12 months, calendar months, by 11.6%. So that's relative basis how it's done, 11.6%. McDonald's during the same uh, period with a similar looking chart has underperformed the S&P by 10.6% over that same period. So while the charts on the surface level look kind of similar, the relative performance is different because the price changes that we're dealing with are actually very different. Um, you know, in the Fidelity chart room, my years running that, we actually use what was called a consistent semi-log scale. So it actually adjusts all these for volatility, which is a painful programming process to go through. But what it did was it tried to uh, adjust for this and give you an apples to apples way of viewing a bunch of charts. That's not the convention. And the convention is to do what we are doing here and most charting platforms would do, which is basically stretch out the vertical axis so you can see as much data as possible. My point is when you're using the candle glance, don't think that all of these are homogenous. Each one of these charts is actually very different depending on uh, the relative performance and the price changes that we're dealing with. That's what uh, your, your experience as an investor is actually going to be. So keep that in mind, number one. Number two is just hitting on those stocks that are up at new, new highs. Which of those stocks that are really getting it done? Nike and P&G are probably really good examples of that. So, you know, even at a time when some stocks are, you know, try, sort of approaching new highs that are at bases that are testing resistance, stocks like Nike have been in pretty good uptrends. This is an interesting one. It's down 1% today at a time when most things are up pretty big. So that's I don't think you can draw too many conclusions for that, but that happening on a sequence of days is what would start to, uh, to concern me a little bit. So you can see the relative strength just starting to turn down, uh, which isn't the end of the world. The trajectory is still strong. The chart overall is holding up uh, pretty well, but that's the kind of divergence you may want to, uh, may want to look for, especially Nike. If you look at, particularly at the chart, we have the gap up here, uh, which was the uh, third week in September, fourth week in September. From there, we really haven't pushed through those highs yet. It's sort of, went to that new gap high and then hasn't really broken above there yet. So that might be a really key trigger to be watching for to see if it's able to uh, eclipse those previous highs or not. Procter & Gamble may be a little different because it has continued to push higher. You can see it's broken clearly above that resistance around 142 or so. Uh, and once again, reclaiming those highs. So on these charts that are up at new highs, the lines to look at are, are down here, which is the, the, uh, the RSI. Uh, P&G is just becoming overbought again. And again, that's not the end of the world. You can see it became overbought here at the end of July and remained in a strong uptrend for another four weeks before it took a bit of a breather. So uh, remember, overbought means up a lot. It doesn't mean the trend is exhausted. It means it should put it on your list of watching for potential signs of trend exhaustion. That's what I would think about, uh, like with the chart of, uh, of P&G. I'm also drawn to, uh, to the charts of uh, the financial stocks. We have JP Morgan, which reports tomorrow. A number of other uh, uh, financial firms are reporting this week as well. So earnings are going to start to be a, a catalyst here for individual stocks if uh, it's not something you've been seeing in a while in, uh, in your portfolio. JP Morgan is an interesting chart because the XLF, as we mentioned, has broken above the 200-day moving average, and now it's testing resistance. JP Morgan is a little, uh, a little bit slower. It has not quite broken above its 200-day just yet. It touched it today, but not able to close above it. If it would close above it, that would be the first close above its 200-day moving average since the beginning of March, end of February. So it's been quite a while where this has been sort of under and it, it sort of revalued down here into the March lows, and it's never really gotten above there. And you see the relative strength has been has been pretty weak from uh, from uh, really last December, to be honest with you. So stocks like this and how they react to earnings, uh, you know, at this point, there's certainly some some optimism being priced in as there's expectations this is going to hold up. Uh, pretty well. And I, I would assume expectations, it continues to go through the 200 day moving average going forward. However, I would be looking at that also resistance at 105 and you'd want it to be able to eclipse those 
sort of, uh, of key uh, milestones before you can assume uh, further upside from there. Also, the RSI is still sort of in that overall bearish uh, range below 60, not really getting above there. So if it's able to remain above there, that would be pretty, uh, pretty encouraging as well. You know, I mentioned P and G, which is a which is a good chart. Uh, and again, we, we've talked about the the Fang stocks. Maybe we'll look at one or two of those in a second. But uh, you know, worth noting charts like Coke. There are things like this that, even though they haven't been relatively super strong, the price is actually holding up pretty well. And Coke has actually had this nice sort of stepwise motion. It, it stalled here around uh, the fifty one fifty to fifty two range, and we're right back up at that point. So if it's able to break to new swing highs, that would you know I think uh, exude some confidence that it could potentially return up to fifty and retest the previous highs. But first things first, it has to get above that next big, uh, that next big resistance level. It has not been able to do it yet. And as it's been basing out here, it's been underperforming other stocks that are, you know, clearly more on the, uh, on the driver's seat. You know, when you look at a chart of Apple, I'm often asked in this sort of environment, you know, a company like Apple is uh, doing a big event tomorrow, iPhone 12. Isn't it all about the iPhone? It's over 50% of their revenues, I want to say, are, are driven off iPhone sales, to, if, not, if not much more. Um, so this is a huge announcement with, uh, you know, the whole 5G capabilities. And, and obviously, isn't that, you know, why would you look at the chart? I would argue this is the time. This is the time to look at the chart. The same thing around earnings. It's not going to tell you what earnings are going to do, but it definitely tells you how people are treating the stock leading up to announcement or earnings, how they're treating it afterwards. This tells you the overarching psychology for investors around this company leading up to the announcement. When a stock does this the day before an event like tomorrow, it tells you people are pricing in pretty good news tomorrow and pretty good expectations for the iPhone 12, expectations about how Apple will continue to do well and hold up very nicely. Otherwise, the price would be going lower. So understanding how we do leading up to the same with Amazon, I think it's a very, uh, very similar story in terms of a big catalyst, uh, potential catalyst coming in. Obviously, a lot of uh, you know, potential good news comes from the Amazon Prime days, which were delayed from July, if I remember right. And so, you know, coming up uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. So the results that might come from that and uh, its signal for consumer behavior, all of that is super, super important. So I would argue now is the time to look at charts, not the time to ignore the charts, it's the time to embrace them and see how people are pricing in expectations for these products and these launches and then look at them afterwards at the end of this week and see how the market reacted to what news we got, what language was used, what the expectations are and, and how they changed. And the charts are the ones that'll tell you what the psychology is with the investors trading those stocks. That is our shifting stock segment. It ended up being a little more philo philosophical than I usually go with, but uh, I felt it, so we went with it. Let's wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one, we just finished talking about Apple and Amazon again. I would argue that this is a very important time to watch it. I think, you know, looking back at the September high, out of all the things that we saw in terms of weakening breadth characteristics and everything, the bearish engulfing pattern on a huge mega cap name like Apple was probably the most telling. So that sort of thing, if and when that would happen, will be one of the things I will absolutely be looking for again. Chart number two is JP Morgan. You know, it's hitting some key resistance right now, uh, hitting the 200 day moving average. Again, has not closed above it since the end of February. So that would be a big change in character. The 105 level lines it up with uh, the swing highs from August. That's also a 50% retracement of this February to March sell-off. If it does eclipse that, I would say upside to 112.50, which would be uh, the final Fibonacci retracement level, 61.8%. Also, this swing high from June. So that would be the next objective. And the question would be whether or not it's able to eclipse that from the upside. Finally, as I mentioned, bond markets closed today. So we didn't focus a lot on fixed income. We will through the remainder of the week for sure. But I think the bond to stock or stock to bond, excuse me, ratio is a really important one. This is the SPIES versus the TLT. So stock prices versus bond prices. Overall, you can see the trend in this ratio from the March low. Since then, you've been paid to own stocks over bonds. That was very different from the beginning of the year, the first quarter, most of it, you really paid to own uh, bonds over stocks. From there, it's been back to stocks. And now the ratio has gone back above the swing high from the end of August. So it's continuing to make new highs. So overall, when you're thinking about allocation, it's telling you lean in to what's working. Folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday for uh, the final bar. As a reminder, we have some great guests over the next couple of days, Jeff Weiss on Tuesday, uh, Mark Newton on Wednesday. So check it out. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night.
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.